I visited family in Ohio recently, and when I was there, I got into a, I don't want to call it a fight, let's just say it was an intense conversation with my brother-in-law. Given the recent division and contentiousness in our society, not to mention what was recently a presidential election coming up, we had this intense conversation about a very serious topic that affects all of us. What is the right way to construct a batting lineup for a Major League Baseball team? My brother-in-law is a high school baseball coach in Cincinnati, and I am not. I played when I was younger, but my coaches said I ran so slow they had to time me with a calendar instead of a stopwatch. So I focused on the numbers, the statistics, and when I grew up I became an analytics data engineer. So for us, the stage was set. Tradition versus science, intuition versus data, cool kids versus the nerds. I threw out some fancy baseball saber metrics, he came back with, you can't bat lefty lefty. I talked about ERA plus and rising pitch counts. He said, pitchers get stale the longer they go on. Everyone knows that. I got mad. I accused him of by the book thinking. He said, well, how do you know you're right? I'll tell you how. I know I'm right because I have data. He said, so? So? Arguments like these play out across the world, from the ball field to the boardroom and everywhere in between. People like my brother-in-law don't care about the numbers. But other people write articles about data engineers like me calling us the sexiest job out there. That's right, I'm not a data nerd, I'm sexy. And we're leaving people like my brother-in-law and his by-the-book thinking in the past. Or so we think. But for anyone paying attention, you might notice that big data has had some rather monumental failures over the years. There was the dot-com bubbles bursting in the early 2000s, the housing crisis in 2008, the Great Recession, even today. In 2019, Gartner released a study saying, Analytics Insights failed to deliver on 80% of their promises for business needs. With numbers like these, I might have to call my agent and have him cancel my photo shoot for Sexiest Man of the Year, because it turns out data and decision science ain't an exact science. And there are three reasons for this. Number one, bad data. Whether it's incomplete or skewed, Bad data can throw a curveball into your decision-making process. I'll give you a few examples. In 1999, NASA lost control of the Mars orbiter because their engineers forgot to convert to the metric system in their calculations. The cost? A mere $125 million. Who doesn't have that lying around, right? And of course, most of us probably remember the Travis Sham mockery that was pollsters trying to predict the 2016 and 2020 presidential elections. Personally, I think the pollsters should stop asking us, who do you think is going to win the next election? And instead ask us, would you like some fries with that? And it's not just the big things either. IBM did a study recently saying that bad data cost the US economy three trillion dollars each year. That's trillion with a capital T, that rhymes with P, and that stands for poor data management, which is about as sexy as Homer Simpson in a thong. So data can be bad. But what happens when you couple that data with algorithms that have bias in them? That brings us to number two, bias. Here in Florida, the criminal courts use a system called Compass, which comprises 137 survey questions from inmates to determine recidivism rates. Recidivism is when inmates might come back after they've been released from prison. Now, a recent analysis has shown that the Compass system regularly underestimates recidivism for white inmates and overestimates recidivism for black inmates. Now, when you consider that this information and data is what drives the decisions for judges and social workers and other servants to determine 
sentencing guidelines, bail amounts, access to services once you've been released from prison. And then we learned that bias in data and systems can have tragic and often heartbreaking effects down the line. Okay, so the data is sometimes bad, and our biases paint it with strange colors, but it's still the prevailing methodology, right? Maybe, but you have to remember that when you try to be logical, you're still influenced by your mother's, uncle's, brother's, cousin Lewis, who says, oh, that ain't a good idea. Or your best friend Charlene, who says, oh, that color blue doesn't look good next to those azaleas. Not to mention you just got into a big blow-up fight with your husband or your wife or your dog. And your stomach just hasn't felt right since you had that chili for dinner the other night. That person sitting next to you is wearing a New York Yankees jersey, and you hate the New York Yankees. And the traffic is horrible, and it's raining again, and your boss keeps texting you, and your kids keep chanting, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, over and over again like deranged Oompa Loompas hell-bent on destruction. And maybe right now the numbers don't matter. Maybe right now the answer is just no, just no, just no, right? Right? Right. Decisions aren't just logic. They're logic and. Logic and emotion. Logic and convenience. Logic and attention. Or as the Harvard Business Review suggests, decisions are largely emotional with a little bit of logic thrown in the end so we can all pretend we're still grown-ups adulting our way through the world around us. Now, maybe you hear this and it makes sense. Or maybe you're like my brother-in-law and you say, so, what's the point? Why does it matter? Well, to understand the answer to that, you have to understand why I was in Ohio having that intense conversation with my brother-in-law. About a year ago, my mom's legs started hurting. She went to the doctor. The, doc the doctor looked at his data. He said, no problem. Take these medications. You'll be fine. But she wasn't. She came back a couple weeks later. Same deal. Looked at his data gave some medication, said, you'll be fine, see you in a week. She did that over and over and over. And several months later, she could barely walk and was in a lot of pain. The doctor said, okay, we're going to do this simple procedure. We've done it a thousand times. It's really easy. No worries. You'll be fine. I talked to her on a Tuesday night. She went in for her procedure Wednesday morning and she never woke up. I wasn't in Ohio to visit family and debate baseball statistics. I was there to say goodbye. Later, looking back, we saw a few signs we think the doctors might have missed, probably because of their experience and their data told them it didn't matter. Maybe little things that could have pushed her outside the norm of standard care. We raised some questions, but they were easily brushed aside. Who are we to question the Western medicine and the data and analytics that was against us? And that's the problem with institutional thinking. You can't question it. You just have to accept it as gospel, or you're the weird one. Now, maybe you haven't lost a loved one. But how many of you have tried to contact your bank's customer service department with an odd question? Or your human resources department at work? And you find out that the service leaves much to be desired, and the, uh, the people are sometimes neither human nor resourceful. Decisions are not scientific. They're not institutional. Decisions are messy. They require time and energy. They're difficult. When people's lives and livelihoods are on the, mat, on the line, we don't have the luxury of going by the book. We have to be engaged. We don't have a choice. So how do we do that? When I got home to Florida for my trip, I stayed up late one night talking over Zoom with my brother-in-law watching the Los Angeles Dodgers play the Tampa Bay Rays in the World Series. The Rays were in the World Series again, even though they're one of the smallest 
of small market teams, largely because their approach to analytics. They have an analytics department just like every other team, but they don't stop at just the numbers. They look at other characteristics like character, teamwork, and team chemistry. The Rays manager, Kevin Cash, puts it this way. He says, we have the numbers to see how these players match on the field, but we also want to see how they match off the field. My brother-in-law and I were watching as one pitcher got laid into a game and they were talking about whether he should be taken out. I commented first. I said, I like this guy. I think he's got moxie. I think he should stay in. My brother-in-law said, what is this, a 1950s sitcom? Moxie? I said, yeah. He said, well, I think he's over 100 pitches now, and his batting average against has gone up, and I think he's going to give up two runs in the next inning. All the stats say so. We had apparently flipped our positions. And I responded, yeah, you're right. The numbers are right. But he's got moxie. <laughs> and what we learned is the same thing Kevin Cash had learned, is that institutional thinking, whether it's tradition versus science, intuition versus data, cool kids versus sexy nerds is the wrong approach. The better approach, the right approach, is a mix. Looking at both sides of the coin to go beyond the paths we've already followed, outside the books that have defined us, to reignite humanity in all decision making. And that, my friends, is very, very, Sexy. Thank you.